All right, so that's Will Ferrell in uh, The Elf, and he is a human adopted by elves in the North Pole. Uh, as a human among elves, he's very different from all of them. As a human in the United States or in, in, our, in our country, uh, being raised by elves, he's also very different from everybody else. So he, but he is different. Uh, God calls Christ followers to be different. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, you've probably heard uh, surveys done where they say there's not much difference between the actions and the behaviors of Christians and non-Christians. You ever heard that? Um, one of my pet peeves with statistics is you got to know what questions were asked and who was surveyed before you even really make any sense out of it. And what they do with that one is they take all Christians and lump them into one group. So you have in that group, you have nominal Christians, just in name only. You have lukewarm Christians. Uh, Willow Creek did a study eight years ago and they divided Christians into four groups. They said there are those that are growing in Christ. They're just getting acquainted with Jesus. Uh, then there are... Um, uh, I don't know what the next category is. Maybe tell me. Um, well, I'll look at my notes. Um, oh, beginning with Christ is the first one. These are people that are just checking out the faith and then growing in Christ is they've actually given their lives to Christ. They're getting acquainted with the Bible, uh, with the church. And then there are those that are close to Christ. Uh, they are, uh, they said Christ is very important to them. They're, they have a close relationship. And then finally are Christ-centered Christians. These people build their whole life around Christ. He's the center. Now, I guarantee you, if you took just Christ-centered Christians and compared their attitudes and behaviors with uh, non-believers, there'd be a huge difference. But let's lay aside my pet peeve about statistics for the moment. Let's just agree that, in general, the behaviors of Christians and non-Christians in our culture are not that different. Um, we are in a culture that is drifting. Nobody drifts upstream. Uh, a driver drifts into oncoming traffic. Uh, a student's mind drifts. Uh, a spouse drifts out of love. A recent Gallup poll found that 44% of so-called Christians are post-Christian. That makes sense. You lump all these Christians together, remember? Nominal, lukewarm, beginning. You lump them all together, 44% of them are post-Christian. That means they no longer believe that there are moral absolutes of right and wrong based on the character of a holy God. They no longer believe the, the Bible is all true. They're post-Christian. In the last 15 years, our attitude has moved from 27% approving gay marriage to 62% approving gay marriage. In many cases, we're not that different from our culture. For many of us, we don't want to be different. We don't want to stand out. I read a, a cartoon of a little boy on his knees by his bed praying, Lord, help me um, be a better boy, but not so much better that the other boys notice. I mean, isn't that speak pretty much for us? We don't want to be that different. We want to be Christians, but we don't want to be fanatics. We want to be Christians, but we don't want to be weird. We don't want to stand out. Uh, if you're not a Christian, you may be thinking, why come to church if it doesn't change you? If it doesn't change your life, make your life better. I mean, if going to church doesn't result in your life being different, what's the point? You ask a good question. For Christ followers to be different, it will require some work. You don't just drift upstream. Going upstream takes effort. Uh, Christians tend to make one of three responses to our drifting culture. One is we accommodate it. In other words, we drift with it. We become like our culture, no difference between us and anybody else. Second is to withdraw. 
These are followers of Christ that really want to be different. They don't think their voice is going to be heard, and so they just kind of withdraw. The third response is to engage the culture. We are different, we try to be different, and engage our cult culture, make a difference in this world. That's what Jesus calls us to do. He calls us to be salt and light. As salt, we're to act as a preservative, to keep the world from drifting further and further into moral corruption. As light, we're to shine the truth of Jesus, uh, the Son of God, into the world. Pastor Wilfredo de Jesus pastors the 17,000-member uh, New Life Community Church in Chicago. This year, they have put up 465 crosses for every uh, person killed in the streets of Chicago this year. And, and the number is increasing every week. Uh, and they've had memorial services for the families of the victims. They are engaging the culture in a meaningful way. God calls you and me to be different. The Apostle Peter, the clear leader of the disciples uh, who followed Jesus, uh, tells us in 1 Peter that Christ's followers are to be different, and he tells us how. Let me give you a little background to this book. Uh, the book of 1 Peter was one of the first books to be accepted into the canon of the Bible. Uh, about 300 years after Jesus died and rose again, uh, church leaders got together to decide which books belong in the Bible. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament was their ultimate conclusion. To get into the canon, you had to be, uh, the book had to be written by a prophet or an apostle. Had to be an eyewitness of the events uh, of Jesus' life uh, to get into the New Testament. The book had to have a, a feeling that you read it and, it and it felt authoritative. Well, Peter, uh, first Peter was one of the first to be placed in the canon uh, showing that clearly uh, people believed that the book was written by Peter. But then about 125 years ago, uh, biblical criticism uh, began to grow as a discipline and people began to ask, eh, I'm not so sure Peter wrote this book. They had a couple questions uh, that caused them to, uh, to, uh, to question his authorship. One was, how could a fisherman, uneducated fisherman, write such a good book as 1 Peter? Uh, 1 Peter is, is very good Greek. It's eloquent Greek, even more smooth than the, the works of the Apostle Paul, and Paul is considered one of the brightest minds in the first century. So I have a couple answers that satisfy me. One is, remember that there was a 30-year gap between when Jesus died and rose again and Peter wrote this book. In 30 years, a person can do a lot. Remember, he's speaking every day to large crowds, leading them to Christ. He's speaking to Hellenistic Jews, uh, Greek-speaking uh, Jews. He's in a bilingual uh, area in Jerusalem and around uh, Israel. So, you know, he's wanting to improve at his writing and his uh, speaking. Uh, why couldn't he be, uh, become educated in that time and written this book? Another answer that satisfies me in, in chapter 5, verse 12, he says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. He tells us that with the help of Silas, he wrote this book. So it's possible this is one of those books where you read the author with, you know, a writer, and uh, Silas is the actual writer, and he's very good at Greek. Uh, it would also explain why some people, uh, they question why is Peter's book so similar to Paul's work theologically? Well, Paul and Silas were a team and went out to various cities. And if Silas is writing it, you could understand why these books come out pretty similar to Paul's uh, books. Another question that causes people to, to question Peter's authorship is, why is Peter writing Gentile Christians in the Roman province of Asia? First verse, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, these are all areas in the east, what, what is today east, the eastern part of Turkey. 
and so people are saying these are Gentile areas. Why uh, Paul is usually considered the one that, that, that speaks to the Gentiles and, and Peter speaks to the Jews. Why is Peter writing to a Gentile audience? Well, a couple thoughts uh, satisfy me. One is when uh, Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost, they say 3,000 people became believers. Uh, we figure in Jesus' day, about 100,000 people lived in Jerusalem. But at Passover, the population would swell to over 2 million. People, Jews, came from all around the world. From these provinces, Bithynia, Pontus, uh, Asia, Cappadocia. So if they gave their lives to Christ, then they went back to those homes and started churches. They would view Peter as their spiritual father who led them to Christ, not Paul. Furthermore, the only one of these five regions that Paul went to was Galatia. And so, um, you know, Paul wouldn't necessarily be writing to these uh, areas uh, anyway. We also uh, believe that Paul, by the time Peter wrote this book, had been martyred. It would make perfect sense for Peter, the leader of the entire church, to be sending, he could send a letter uh, after Paul's died to any of Paul's churches. God calls you and me to be different. How can we be different? How can we engage our culture and make a difference in this world? Peter suggests four ways in 1 Peter 1, 13 to 21. First, set your hope on the grace Jesus Christ will reveal. Verse 13, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Since our hope is in the future, we can endure the present. Uh, everyone can endure present struggles if they're certain it's leading somewhere. That's why an Olympic athlete goes into years of training. That's why a student will stay up late studying. Or an employee will put in extra hours on a project. Because there's a reward. But take away that purpose and payoff, and the struggles become almost unbearable. When you face temptation and realize that if you do not give into it, the payoff is huge, there's a lot bigger chance that you'll be able to stand firm. If you encounter opposition to your faith at school or work, but realize that you'll make a bigger impact by being different, there's more motivation to stand strong for Christ. Peter tells us that when Christ returns, he will reveal the glorious future that will be ours. Then we will see that any effort we made to be different, to engage our culture, was worth it. So remember that God calls you and me to be different. There's a second way Peter suggests that we should be different, and it's do not conform to your sinful desires. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Now, this suggests that he's writing to a Gentile audience. When you lived in ignorance, the, the Gentiles had no knowledge of the Old Testament, God's commands, and no knowledge of Jesus until they received it from Peter and and then on. So they were in their ignorance, former ignorance, he's, ta he's telling them. Before we knew Christ, before we read the Bible, we were ignorant of God's call to be different. But now that we know Christ, we're not to conform to our old sinful desires. We're to be different. In no way do I condone Islamic terrorism. Uh, but we do have to recognize that some Islamic Militants are angry at the West for exporting hedonism and materialism into their homes through TV and internet, causing Muslims to be uh, lazy religiously and morally corrupt. A 1985 communique from Hezbollah said, Our way is one of radical combat against depravity, and America is the original root of depravity. Uh, anger at Western decadence fueled the writings of the radical Saeed Koub, which greatly influenced Osama bin Laden. So some militants today see themselves not so much as terrorists, but as holy warriors fighting a war against moral corruption. When we tolerate...
trash on television and allow pornography into our lives through the internet or our cell phones, we are inflaming radical Islam and shutting down any hope of their countries wanting to become democratic. They, they look at us and say, look what your democracy got you. Chuck Colson, in his book, The Sky is Not Falling, uh, tells us that the Kaiser Foundation reports that 77% of primetime TV shows include sexual content, averaging almost six sex scenes per hour. I mean, come on, God. This is our culture. If we're not to conform to our sinful desires, which were, er, were ours in our ignorance, then we must exercise discipline. We must discipline ourselves to stay away from practices and activities that lead us away from Christ. We must di discipline ourselves to become different because God calls you and me to be different. The third way Peter suggests for us to be different is to be holy. Now here's a word we don't hear much about today. You don't hear about, talked about often. 1 Peter 1.15, read this with me. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Wow. Holy in all you do. That includes when the ducks lose the game in the last <laughs> few minutes. Holy is to be different. The word holy means set apart for God. It means to be different. Now, what's the big deal about being holy? Peter's book is about standing firm in hard times. The people he's writing to are facing increasing persecution under the rule of Emperor Nero. Peter wants to make sure that the suffering they're experiencing is not due to bad choices they're making, where they're bringing it on themselves. So he says, be holy. Why should we be holy? Peter suggests three reasons. One, because God is holy. Verse 16, read this with me. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. God is revealed in the Bible not, not just as being good, but also as being holy. He is totally just, upright, and pure. When God calls us into a relationship with Christ and we respond by giving our lives to Christ, God puts the Holy Spirit inside of us. We are then to be holy because God is holy. His Holy Spirit lives within us. When Jesus came, uh, Greek thought was prevalent, ruled the day, and part of Greek thought was dualism. A division between the body and the mind and the spirit. The body was considered evil, and the mind and spirit were considered good. Well, guess what? Dualism has come back today in secular thinking. By secular thinking, I mean any thinking that comes from the idea that there is no God, that this world developed without a divine creator, and there is no uh, God that has created moral absolute based on his holy character. That's secular thinking. In our secular thinking today, dualism is rampant. Separation from our, of our body from our soul and spirit. We can't understand the moral confusion of our day unless we grasp this underlying person-body dualism. The idea that sex outside of marriage is morally okay implies that the body is merely a vehicle for getting what you want, just as you use a car to get where you want. This runs totally against the grain of the Christian worldview that God has created us each as individuals as unities, person and soul and spirit or person and body. We reject any dualism that separates the body as merely into a, a merely instrumental role. This explains why God speaks so strongly all through the Bible against uh, sex outside of the marriage relationship between a man and a woman. It violates our wholeness, our integrity. Apostle Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your bodies. 
when we engage in any unholy sex outside of marriage, we violate God's spirit who lives within us. Why be holy? Why be holy? Uh, Peter suggests another reason, because God will judge each one of us. Verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. We will all stand before God someday when Christ returns. You may be able to fool people with how holy you are, how well you're doing, but we can't fool God. So remembering that we'll have given account to God someday motivates us to live holy lives. And finally, why be holy? Because Jesus paid a great price for our sins. Uh, a number of years ago, Jory and I bought a, a brand new a Honda Pilot. And uh, I'll tell you, I took really good care of that car. I wouldn't let kids get in the car without taking a shower. I'd say no food is going to be eaten in this car. And we kept that rule for uh, quite a while. The car is eight years old now and standards have really, really gone down. But when you buy something and you spend good money on it, you take care of it, right? Peter says... For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you redeemed from the empty way of life handed out to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, you raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. Jesus paid for your sins and mine with his precious blood. Why would we want to go back to our old way of living, to our old sinful desires, after all he spent for us? A couple weeks ago, I suggested to you when you're making decisions, uh, to, to, look, to, to understand the consequences of your decisions, you need to play the movie forward. If I do this, what will be the result consequence if I continue to live this way what will be the consequence play the movie forward in your life what will happen it helps me to think of all the lives I would hurt if I engaged in sexual immorality I would hurt my wife Jory I would hurt my son Tad his wife Diana my son David and his wife Holly my son Luke my son Joel my son Mark my daughter, Andrea, my daughter, Cam, my daughter, Jamie, and our youngest daughter, Erica. We also have four grandchildren. I would hurt Leah and Zoe and Addie and Isaiah. And then I would hurt all our church staff. And I would hurt all you people. One act of carnality is a poor exchange for a lifetime of lost legacy. Max Lucado in his book, uh, Dad Time, says, how many of you parents would deliberately break an arm of one of your children? You say, I would never do that. It goes against all the fiber of my moral being. But he says, if you engage in sexual activity outside your marriage, you are hurting your child far more than you would if you broke their bone. Why would we want to hurt people we love or squander the precious blood of Christ by failing to live holy lives? God calls you and me to be different. He calls it holiness. Peter suggests one more way that we can be different. Depend on the Holy Spirit. You may be thinking, I'm supposed to be different. I'm not that different. I'm supposed to be holy. I don't feel very holy. And I don't see how knowing that I'm supposed to be different and holy is going to help me get there. Well, this is where being a Christ follower is totally different from any other faith system in the world. And every other faith system, it all depends on what we do. Jesus said you can't do it. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. You can't be good enough to meet God's holy standard. You fall short. I came and lived a perfect, sinless life and died for your sins and all sins in the world. 
If you give your life to me and trust what I did for you, then I will put the Holy Spirit inside of you and he'll give you the will and the desire to be different. Verse two, Peter says, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Sanctify means to set apart. So it's really the same as holy. The Holy Spirit makes us different. You still can't do it, but if you depend on the Holy Spirit, He will help you and strengthen you and help you to be different. Did you know that if you fly from Portland to Chicago, you look in the cockpit, there are hundreds of dials there, control panels, and uh, pilots tell us that on a trip of 2,000 miles like that, they touch those uh, controls more than 2,000 times. Just slight course alterations. That's the same way with us. We need the Holy Spirit to direct us, re-guide us hundreds of times a day. April 15th, 1912, the Titanic sank. It was considered an unsinkable ship. It was considered a floating dream. The reason we're fascinated with the Titanic is because we all know the accident was avoidable. The captains uh, received four warnings. They ignored them all. By the time the captain realized they were approaching an iceberg, it was too late. The Holy Spirit gives us dozens of warnings throughout each day. I call them promptings. The only question is, will we listen to his warnings or will we ignore them? Following Christ is all about listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and following them. He gives us the power to be different. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for these strong words of the Apostle Peter writing to Christians, Gentile Christians, in the first century that are being persecuted and facing lots of pressure. He says, make sure it's not by your own bad behavior. Be holy, be different, be obedient. And Lord, we're uh, convicted today, likewise. Maybe you're here and you're not sure you've ever given your life to Christ. Why don't you give your life to Christ right now? I'll give you a minute to pray. Just say, I believe you're God's son and you died for me. I want you in my life. Would you forgive me my sins and put your Holy Spirit inside of me? Maybe you're already a Christ follower, but you're convicted today that you're not that different. You're not that holy. Would you ask God to forgive you? And tell him you want to take this challenge seriously to, to be different and to be a change agent in this world. I'll give you all a minute just to talk to God silently. Lord God, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you that you are a holy God. You are pure, you're upright, you're just. We can count on you every time. And we want to become like you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that you placed within us if we've given our lives to Christ that gives us a shot at wanting to be different and the power to begin to make feeble attempts in that direction. In Jesus' name we pray.